This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California.
This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California.
This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate.
This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Este es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. This is the California State Senate. Esta es el Senado Estatal de California. This is the California State Senate. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Sorry that we're running a little bit late, but it's been uh, a pleasure to uh, welcome a lot of you in per person. Thank you for allowing me to do that. And if, if we can ask people to begin taking their seats and the members to uh, come to the Dias now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for for being here today, for attending the Select Committee on California-Mexico Cooperation in, in the very beautiful 40th Senate District, my home, the place of my birth, the most beautiful district in California in my eyes. <laughs> I'd like to uh, first of all begin by thanking the city of National City, uh, the mayor, thank you for being here today, Mayor Alejandra, Alejandra Sotelo Solis, and, and the, the council, we have Ron Morrison here, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for you allowing us to use this beautiful facility. Calif uh, National City is, is a city of just wonderful amenities, and, and you, you all do such a great job uh, at uh, running this city, so I'm very proud uh, to uh, 
to represent the city of National City. And thank you for allowing us to uh, be here today. Uh, also, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, especially our panelists that are here uh, to share some comments about our, our uh, developing our binational identity here in Cal California, in Baja California, San Diego, Tijuana, and r really what is the, the, what they call now the Los Anti, Los Anti re region coming from LA to, to Tijuana. But uh, it really goes beyond Tijuana, down into Ensenada. It's ba California, Baja California, an area that is really mystical with, with history and just uh, uh, in impressive with this enormous economy that, that uh, uh, keeps us all uh, wor prospering and working very hard and makes us all so proud to be from uh, these states. This committee that we're having today was created to address the important issues surrounding California's collaboration with Mexico, our relationship with Mexico, what we can do to strengthen that relationship to build on our combined resources and, and grow together and prosper together. Uh, as uh, communities along the border, uh, as myself representing the entire California uh, border with, with Mexico, uh, we, I know and we all know firsthand how important California's relationship with Mexico is. They're our largest trading partner and this relationship is, is critical to our state's prosperity and our well-being. We, we know that California is the fifth largest economy and, and met our relationship with Mexico contributes a very large part to that prosperity. This hearing will provide an opportunity to better understand the current status uh, of, of cross-border tourism and what additional policies and mechanisms are necessary to grow California's economic relationship with Mexico or across our shared border. I'm honored to have my colleagues here with me today. We have uh, Ben Allen is uh, about 10 minutes away. He's, he's, he's stuck in traffic, unfortunately. But he's on his way, and we also have uh, Senator uh, Stephen Bradford from uh, Gardenia in, in LA County. We also have our local Senator Brian Jones uh, from uh, the Santee area, and we also have Senator Henry Stern uh, from uh, Los Angeles and Ventura counties uh, also here. Uh, these are uh, very important members of this committee that make up this committee. And I really want to thank them for uh, making the trip out to San Diego to be part of this committee to formalize a dialogue and exchange information on issues that uh, impact the state of California and Mexico. I also want to give a very warm welcome to a very close personal friend, a wonderful person that just does an amazing job representing the interests of Mexico, our new consul. To San, to San Diego, Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, uh, just recently joined our community, not new to California, but he will now be uh, the, the representative of Mexico in San Diego. He's been, I have to say, an instrumental partner in facilitating the uh, important binational discussion since I arrived in Sacramento. I think we might have arrived around the same time. When I arrived, he arrived, and we've been working together all these years uh, he, he took a little side tour to Austin. Uh, he did such a great job in California that I think they saw fit to punish him. <laughs> but we're really so happy to have you back. I can't say enough how pleased and uh, we are. To ha I, I am, and I know that uh, San Diego will c first come to realize what an important resource you will be to this community as well. So welcome, and. Um, if I'd love to invite you to say a few words, I mean, your visit here and your presence here is is very momentous. And if and if you're interested, would you like to share some comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Select Committee on California-Mexico cooperation, dear friends. 
Um, thank you, Senator Ben Hueso, um, for this opportunity. As Rod Stewart says, some guys have all the luck. <laughs> in my previous life, I was Consul General of Mexico in Sacramento, where I met Chairman Hueso and many friends present uh, today. Um, uh, now I have the chance to, rec to reconnect with, with uh, the Senator and with all of you and keep working on a strong agenda to promote Mexico-California's collaboration. I began my post as Consul General of Mexico in San Diego a month ago, and I have immediately witnessed the strength of the cross-border um, relations in this region. Uh, the California, Baja California region is a model of success for binational cooperation. Their close interaction is an example of the enormous potential of cross-border regions for productivity, innovation, inclusion, and of course, tourism. Four or five years ago, the New York Times published an article in which a local survey found out that more than 60% of San Diego residents had never crossed the border. I hope this has already changed. I will do my share, dear friends, working together with the chairman and with all of you to bring San Diego and Baja California's president to So please see me as an ally in this mission. Mexico and the U.S. share more than a border. We are strong partners and friendly neighbors. My priority, my top priority as Consul General of Mexico in San Diego is clear. I have to represent Mexico in a constructive and positive manner, especially to the American people and key decision makers in this region who are not familiar with my country, despite being next door. In that sense, my priority as well is to identify key partners like you who can help us in shaping such a positive future. Muchísimas gracias. bit of background uh, for everybody. Uh, overall, tourism is actually booming in California. We've actually had nine consecutive years of record-breaking growth, um, as this chart in indicates, this next one, um, topping uh, $140 billion in spending. Uh, that's great news for Californians. Uh, it's generating $12 billion in tax revenue and employing directly over one million Californians. Mexico is a very important part of that success. It's actually our undisputed number one international market. And a couple things I want to share with you today is, is how we promote California in Mexico, who we target uh, as part of that, and our overall All Dreams Welcome messaging. Uh, as part of that campaign where we're also partnering with the Governor's Office of Economic Development, or GOBiz, on uh, global branding around All Dreams Welcome for California. As I said, Mexico is our number one international market. Um, our 2019 visitation forecast is, is projected to reach 631,000. That's air only. 
Um, the air uh, passengers um, are representing uh, a, almost a billion dollars in spending, but when you combine that with also the cross-border traffic, uh, ground uh, visitors, we're looking at 8 million annual person trips and about $3.5 billion in spending. So as I said, it's, it's our number one international market. It falls within our tier one markets, meaning we invest heavily in that market. We're spending about $5 million a year in that market, and it's one of the few markets globally that we're actually spending directly against the consumer as part of our California Dream Big Global Brand Initiative. Uh, so much so that, that we have many activations and they're all in language. But really, it's about reaching um, our, our air uh, passenger customers through uh, many activations, the branding piece, and then other cooperative marketing opportunities. We just did one with Kidzania, that's the theme parks in, uh, in Mexico, uh, reaching what is very important to us is the family experience pillar in Mexico. But just to give you a snapshot of our branding efforts, um, in Mexico, uh, I'll show you a campaign, it's called Spoiled, like we're all spoiled to live here in California and we want to share that with the world. Uh, of course, all of our Spanish speakers will understand it and you'll see some great California celebrities like Yaya DaCosta, Dax Shepard, and Tyler Florence. Let's roll that. California somos unos consentidos, pero no es nuestra culpa. Nosotros no tuvimos nada que ver con esto. Tan solo nos tocó estar aquí. Está lleno de magia y de maravillas inesperadas. Es demasiado bueno para ser verdad. A veces tenemos que pellizcarnos para saber que todo esto es real. Que no es un sueño. A lo mejor sí estamos muy consentidos. Pero todos están invitados. Ven, seguro saldrás muy consentido de aquí. Comienza tu viaje en visitcalifornia.com.mx So that's running uh, as we speak right now in Mexico, uh, and really that's that's the call to action. But the the bigger invitation uh, that we saw so important to develop, uh, and we launched it globally, but we started in Mexico was our All Dreams Welcome campaign uh, as a response of some of the heightened political rhetoric that was coming out of Washington in the last couple of years. And we know that we are a culture of inclusive, inclusivity as well as diversity. And we wanted to make sure that for all the work that we've done, um, and, and the Consul General said it so eloquently, you know, it's much bigger than a trading relationship. These are friends, family, including myself personally, um, and, and many of you that, that share this border and this place and, and this common identity. We're very passionate about that. And California has a unique story to tell. So we launched the campaign, All Dreams Welcome, that was launched by a diplomatic mission, our first in a 25-year history, where we brought uh, many of the gateway mayors down with us a couple years ago, uh, including the mayor of San Diego, to talk about how we, you know, business as usual, that, that we are family and those connections are very important as well as working with our Mexican counterparts in the consulates and uh, the administration there. Uh, it was very successful. It has uh, multiple channels and activations and it continues to be our biggest message. As a matter of fact, just last week, uh, we launched the California Welcome Center at the Cross Border Express. Uh, I'm excited to hear from my friend and colleague Jorge later about the success of the Cross Border Express. Um, but that was one of the major, major initiatives as part of the diplomatic mission was to use the Cross Border Express as our media availability when we launched that. And now, just last week, we opened a California Welcome Center at the Cross Border Express. Um, and they're having cr incredible momentum and growth. And, and that just is a physical concierge of, you know, providing that rolling out of the red carpet and the, and the welcome mat uh, for our friends and fellow travelers coming from Mexico. Um, it, frankly, he'll talk about all points in the world into California. It's, it's very unique. I like to say around the world, I'm, I'm part of the World Travel and Tourism Council, that we build bridges, not walls. And, and that's what it is. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's just what a wonderful success story and, and just living 
the dream of, of what we all see is is this bicultural identity that that we are all so fortunate to share. Um, so with that, we had also content uh, around multiple channels with All Dreams Welcome. And so I'll just close my brief comments with the video content that, that we chose to launch as part of the follow-up to the diplomatic mm -hmm. mission that still lives today. Um, also, um, what's neat about this is this is curated content. These are actually real people just enjoying the California experience. Uh, and and I'll, I'll close with that. So let's see you all dreams welcome. I take you everywhere I go. Come on and let your color show. Things we couldn't see All the dreams that could be Thank you, members of the committee. Happy to answer any questions after the panel. Appreciate it from anyone. Thank you. We, before we conti uh, uh, continue to our next panelists, I just wanted to continue thanking our, our visitors here. And, and this event is uh, informational, uh, but it's also an opportunity for us to connect. So I wanted to also thank uh, some very important people that we have here today in addition to uh, the mayor of National City, Alejandro Sotelo Solis, and council member uh, Ron Morrison. We also have uh, represented here uh, with the office of Juan Vargas. Uh, Mr. Martinez is here today. Thank you, Ricardo, for being here. Uh, we also have uh, from the Otay Mesa Chamber of Commerce, uh, Alejandra Meriteran is here. Very important uh, promoting uh, Otay Mesa and also with the National City of Chamber of Com Commerce, Jacqueline Reynoso is also here. Raise your hand when I call you, just say, so people say hello. Uh, the San Diego Regional Chamber, I thought I saw Paula Avila here today. Where, are she here? Raise your hand, don't be afraid. <laughs> of course, everybody knows her here and all these individuals, but still. Uh, we also have uh, Jason Wells with the San Isidro Chamber of Commerce. And we have a San Isidro School Board member, Rudy Lopez, is here as well. And uh, we'll be hearing uh, later on, we'll have some panelists here that we'll introduce in just a bit. But we'll come back to our uh, panelists. And um, we have with us today, we're very uh, honored to have uh, Barb Newton, the president of the California Travel Association. Uh, the California Travel Association is the uh, uh, the very influential unified voice of travel and the tourism industry in California, which is a, a thriving industry. And we just want to thank her for being here today and taking the time to be part of this panel. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Rueso, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, as you said, California Travel Association is the voice of the travel and tourism industry for the state. We're also known as Cal Travel. And we protect and advance the interests and investments of the California travel industry through advocacy, collaboration, and education. So our members are made up of the cities, destinations, hotels, resorts, airports, airlines, uh, rental cars, really any organization for whom travel and tourism is an important part of their business uh, is a category of, of membership for us. We applaud the efforts that uh, Senator Hueso is making to leverage tourism. Um, to develop a positive binational identity and a vibrant, mutually beneficial partnership between Mexico and California. 
As Carolyn said, we have had, uh, we've benefited from nine great years of growth in the travel and tourism industry and continue to see a very strong economy. But I also uh, talk to my members about what are the challenges and issues that, that we face. And there are a few troubling areas that we're focused on in addition to the national, uh, the man-made challenges and uh, the natural challenges. We polled our members in July on what factors they thought could affect the travel and tourism business the most in the next 12 months. We asked them to rank their issues from one to five, with five being the most important. Uh, national travel policies was rated 4.3 out of five. California's image to the rest of the country, 4.62 out of five. And California's image to the rest of the world, 4.76 out of five. So my members are saying that they are uh, really challenged by the climate that we're working in. These concerns rank higher than many of our hot button issues like homelessness, which was 4.03 out of five, or sustainability, which is 4.16 out of five. So I think uh, these results speak to awareness of our state's travel and tourism industry that we really need to be proactive in encouraging visitors to come to our destinations. We do embrace all legitimate travelers. I think you can see from the messaging that's coming out from Visit California and also from our individual members. We see many of them creating uh, commercials and, and messaging to encourage neighbors, especially uh, from the South, to vacation in California, really send that welcoming message um, that we are open to all and we love to have that visitation. We believe truly that tourism is the best way to get people to appreciate different points of view and different cultures. So we certainly at, at Cal Travel, we understand the deep independence of Mexico and California for economic growth, for employment, for commerce, and for quality of life on both sides of the border. And we wanna support policies that ensure that continued success. Among other strategies at Cal Travel, our advocacy efforts support infrastructure development, ease of travel across the border, investment in our regional airports, and educational and cultural exchanges between our two countries. We welcome this dialogue and this opportunity to, uh, to continue this conversation, and we really appreciate the efforts of Senator Hueso and all the leaders here. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to mention Lisa Cohen. I, are you hiding from me somewhere? I haven't seen you. There you are. <laughs> Somebody told me you're here. But uh, Chula Vista Chamber of Commerce, thank you for being here. Uh, we will now uh, go to our next panelist, uh, uh, looking, uh, that will look at uh, the two-nation vacation and the uh, regional impacts of cross-border tourism. Our next speaker is Carrie Kapich. She's a COO for the San Diego Tourism Authority. The San Diego uh, Tourism Authority seeks to uh, improve tourism to economically be benefit the San Diego region. Tour tourism is the second largest segment of the San Diego economy and employs approximately 194,000 people. Uh, the San Diego Tourism Authority is a private nonprofit mutual benefit corporation composed of approximately 1,000 members and a, a th thousand member organizations, businesses, local governments, and individuals seeking to better community through the visitor industry. Thank you for being here today and for all that you do for our region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator, and thank you to the committee for having us here today. We're very excited to talk about our work that we do together um, to promote our binational region. So a little bit about the Tourism Authority. We are 65 years old. Um, we're looking pretty good for 65. We're a nonprofit, so we're a 501c6, and our mission is to economically benefit the San Diego community. So we are here to help drive the tourism economy, but also too to make sure that we're good stewards of our community, and certainly our relationships with our friends and family and neighbors to the South is a very important part of that. We have an operational budget this year at $50 million, so we're able to do a global marketing program. We're actually marketing San Diego in eight countries around the world. So we have a, a wonderful uh, community that's here that works together. From a tourism perspective, um, for context, we are a top five destination for Americans to travel into our community and the 11th most visited for international travelers. We're a top meeting and convention destination. That's strong foundational business for any community. 
We had almost 36 million visitors this last year into San Diego, and we're only a population of 3.3 million within the San Diego County area. So that's 10 visitors for every one resident. So very important that we're doing the right things to take care of our visitors and take care of our residents. The regional impact is huge. We're the second largest traded economy for San Diego, so tourism is very important to the vitality of our region. And it's also important that we have that air access both into our international airport at San Diego, but also into Tijuana. And we're excited to be working with CBX and doing more to bring visitors in through that gateway to San Diego. We see this relationship twofold. One is Mexico is a market into San Diego, it's a market into California. We have over 4.6 million visitors come into San Diego on an annual basis. Many of those are day visitors that are coming in to do tourism purposes like shopping, go to our attractions, go to our restaurants. We have about 430,000 people that stay the night from Mexico here in San Diego. And mostly it's to visit friends and family. We are a very connected community. That's the fabric of who we are within this bi-national region. So people coming in primarily to see their friends and family, but also for leisure purposes for vacation, and of course for business purposes as well. We are very fortunate that within Mexico, we have representation for San Diego. So we are with a group called PR Central. They are boots on the ground for us in Mexico City. They're doing trade development. They are also um, providing education for travel agents and tour operators. And I should point out um, the gentleman who actually supervises that work, which is Phil Hannes. Way Phil, most people know Phil. He's been on board with us for two years now. Um, overseeing the work that PR Central is doing in our international market development efforts. So we're very fortunate to have that representation that extends our staff south of the border. We do quite a bit in terms of bringing people into our community, so doing FAM trips where somebody actually travels into San Diego and gets the experience of San Diego. Um, and we do events where we go into Mexico and we take our community down to meet with our travel partners south of the border. So we're um, always doing events, we're doing sales missions, we do groups where we bring media over into our community or we bring other agents from around the world into San Diego and oftentimes we're doing not only San Diego but also Baja California as well. One of the things that we've done successfully is work together um, with Best Day, which is an OTA uh, out of the Mexico market, talking about the Cali Baja experience. So this is a two-nation vacation where we're promoting a stay in San Diego and a stay in Baja. We were able to do this through activations with advertising that we did in Mexico. We were also um, doing uh, presence at malls around Mexico, primarily Mexico City. So promoting that as a travel package that you could buy through Best Day. So that's been one um, that's a very tangible um, example of how communities can work together to put together a tangible product that can be purchased. We also have a very strong public relations program of work and we often say that just bringing people into the community and letting them have that experience so for a travel writer to come in and to come to San Diego and to also go into the Baja community is something that's been resonating as a story. Earlier this year, Travel and Leisure talked about the San Diego Baja region as being the best of both worlds. It's truly an an impressive um, story to be told and one that has resonated with travel writers from around the world. Now we also um, work with the Baja California community as tourism partners and as development partners. We have signed letters of agreement between um, our community and also with Tijuana and Ensenada. And we've done signing agreements talking about the work that we do collaboratively. We promote each other on each other's websites. We promote each other within our visitor guide information. We've done programs like I mentioned earlier with the Baja California Best of Experience through the OTAs. We're very active participants. In those groups like this with the select committee, talking about how we work together and how we work together better. So whether it be the Smart Border Coalition or the Regional Chamber of Commerce, um, many different partners to keep that dialogue and those communications opened and strong. 
And of course, I mentioned earlier CBX and the Tijuana Airport, very important to the San Diego region and our regional economy. So I'm going to end with a TV spot that we've been running in the Mexico market so you can see how we're promoting San Diego. Uh, but again, we do talk very much about this being a binational region, and it's a story that we take out constantly. <laughs> Where have you been taking all in? Miles and miles away. The air is magic, breathing rapid. We'll be happy, happy today. Oh, oh, so good. Thank you so much for having us today. I appreciate Thank it very much. We'll hear uh, now from Cindy Gomper Graves, President and CEO of the South County uh, EDC, which has been uh, a promoter of, of bringing investments to the South Bay. So she'll give us a perspective on the the economic and investment perspective. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Senator Wayso, and thank you for hosting this and to the committee members for being in South Bay today. We appreciate this. Um, first of all, I want to applaud the committee for investigating the opportunity to jointly market the states of California and Baja California. From an economic perspective, tourism dollars are some of the best dollars you can bring into the region for one simple fact. I don't know if you've been on vacation lately, but usually you bring a fat wallet with you. You spend a lot of money in hotels and restaurants and experiences and you buy all sorts of things and then you go home. And the reason why that's good is because you leave your tax dollars here and typically don't use the services that tax dollars normally provide. So we're taking the TOT dollars from you and reinvesting those back into the communities where you are. We're also taking the sales tax from the tourists and not using them to serve those tourists typically, right? They go home, but reinvesting in our infrastructure to support our communities and continue this great quality of life we enjoy in the San Diego, Tijuana area. Um, these economic dollars typically are multipliers of at least 1.5. Some studies I've looked into show, that, show it as much as 2.5. So what does that mean? For every dollar generated in tourism, that means that the community is getting 1.5 in a spinoff effect up to a 2.5 in a spinoff effect for those tourism dollars. The other thing that tourism does, and if we do our jobs correctly in economic development, it means that we'll give opportunities to some of our particularly smaller businesses to have new, a new and expanded customer base with new tourists coming to spend some of that money in their wallets. I wanted to share that with you because I do think tour, tourism is one of the greatest assets that we have in the San Diego Tijuana area. And just to show you what's happening in San Diego, and particularly in Chula Vista, I join with um, Lisa Cohen in Chula Vista and the um, Port of San Diego and the city of Chula Vista in celebrating the fact that we just had a brand new hotel and convention center approved about two weeks ago. Um, it is through the Rita development. It'll be a 1600 room hotel minimum with over 300,000 square feet of convention center. And that is one of several ho hotel pads that are going to be happening on the Chula Vista Bayfront. Dream with me for a second. Okay, we keep saying, we're running out of room at the convention center, at the San Diego Convention Center. What are we gonna do? We're gonna expand. While we're waiting for that expansion to happen and we do support that expansion, there's something else we can do. And that would be to create a water taxi. So when you're at Comic-Con, we'll say, at the convention center, instead of telling you get in your car and drive to Chula Vista to see the next breakout session, walk down the back steps of the convention center, take a scenic tour across the San Diego Bay and go to the, to the next session, which is at the Chula Vista Bayfront. And dream bigger with me. And what if we said, we're gonna have the first binational big convention ever, so hop on that water taxi and take it and go into one of the hotels along the coastline in Baja, California. It's possible. And we can do that. We just have to dream big. And that is the essence of binational tourism. It's not just about saying, hey, come to both of us here. It's about the connections that we have to have. Obviously, the cross-border, express across cross-border terminal, Jorge, was one of the first great things that we did. Improvements to our ports of entry is essential to making this work 
but we can do better. And that's what I would challenge this committee, senators, to do, is to not only market our binational areas, but invest in the infrastructure. We need to truly make it connected and truly make it a binational experience. Um, we have some unique opportunities here in the California Baja area that are already served by, we've already mentioned the cross-border express, but then also some of our cruise ships, and then of course cars, walking across the border, all that stuff works. If we band together, we can share our resources, we can market this as one whole region, both the state of Baja and the state of California, to the rest of the world, and do it more fiduciarily responsible, yeah, I should say in a more fiduciary responsible manner than we currently do with Baja Marketing, Baja California Marketing, California saying you can get two for one. Let's really make it two for one. Let's just talk, just talk about it. Let's do it. Let's make it this great thing to where we're pulling our resources and hitting the rest of the world. I kind of know that if you live in San Diego, you kind of know about the Baja area. And if you live in Baja, you kind of know about California. But what about the rest of the world? We have so much biodiversity here that people enjoy and can see that we need to dream, dream just a little bit bigger and then work hard to implement it. I want to also leave you with an example of something South County EDC did that I think might make the tourism hits a little bit easier and actually it's a credit to uh, Carrie and her team. South County EDC represents the city of Chula Vista, National City, Imperial Beach, Coronado, the southern part of San Diego, and the communities of Otay and Bonita. And we embarked on a tourism effort called San Diego South Bay. We had not worked together to market in a joint, cohesive manner. And this um, collaborative effort allowed us to um, expose people to what is traditionally overlooked and, uh, tourism opportunities in the South Bay. And to begin with this, we started with a volunteer task force. We created a website and a social media um, platform, and that allowed many, many different people to input their information onto this website and on the social media. But the most successful thing we did was we partnered with the San Diego Tourism Authority. We met with Joe Terzi and said, Joe, we're missing it. South County could be so much better on your website. and We can give you the stuff. And, and to their credit, and I'm still grateful to this day, they said, give us what you've got. Give us your pictures. Give us your, your articles. Give us everything. We'll connect with them. We'll put them on the site. And so they not only took everything we had, but they also created a link back to um, our San Diego South Bay tourism website. So what did that do? Overnight, it took San Diego South Bay from having maybe a couple hundred hits to exposure to over two million visitors that visit their site on an annual basis. That's the kind of exposure we can have. And I think by partnering and cross-promoting um, um, each other, we can do this in a better way. I think by working together and truly getting the infrastructure that we need to make this happen can actually bring the type of tourism that we need to make this work. And then lastly, if we do it in a fiscally responsible manner by pooling our resources instead of just mentioning it, oh, by the way, there's this and that, we can actually make this a truly binational effort. And I thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much. The global economy began when the first road was built between one community and another in the history of mankind. And roads are what connect communities. Roads are primarily used for trade. And every time we invest in building a connection, it's something that helps to increase our economy. And we have found that in a study that we did here in San Diego County that reducing border wait times helps, can, can increase California and Mexico's economy to the tune of billions of dollars. And I've been working very hard to do that. We established a fund, uh, a uh, ports fund, that was uh, designed to reduce border wait times. And we deposited 250 million as our state's contribution to do this. And we're actively pursuing those local projects, border projects, ports projects that will help in the area of trade because it's so important to growing our economy. Our next speaker, Jorge Goy Tortua, is the CEO of Cross Border Express, a project that I had the pleasure of working on when I was on the council here in San Diego. And we have lots of people here in this uh, uh, hearing today that were instrumental in making this happen, and including uh, Mr. Goy Tortua. 
Uh, this is a 390-foot bridge that connects the Tijuana International Airport with the uh, community of Otay Mesa in San Diego. And it is the first building of its kind to connect the USA to a foreign airport terminal. And it has been uh, an enormous success. It was envisioned, it, was, uh, it just took amazing vision to suggest this project. But it's been a bigger success than anybody could have imagined in that the, the parking continues to expand, the facility continues to expand, and they continue to welcome more members every single day. And I thought that it'd be very important to have you here today. Thank you for being here and sharing uh, uh, your experience with this wonderful asset that we have here that furthers our opportunity to reduce border wait times and also to promote our, our region as a bi binational region. Thank you. Jorge. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Wesson. Thank you all for having us. As, as you mentioned, this is a beautiful project. And uh, as I'm pretty new in the, in the region, uh, every time that I interact with people, I hear these uh, comments of everyone involved in this project to make it happen. So we're very, very honored to be part of the community and to contribute to the development of the tourism industry among the region. So no question that the, the relation between Mexico and U.S. Is, is, is key. And for us, for Cross Border Express, is, is, is all. We also know Cross Border Express as CVX. And uh, let me share that from misconception, uh, uh, we, we tended to, to change the paradigm of transportation between the U.S. and, and Mexico, especially from Southern California to, to Mexico offering a faster and more convenient way to cross the busiest border of the world. Uh, and given the fact that Tijuana Airport was an airport used for many, many years from on, not only Southern California residents, and I recall when I started my career in 1992 in Guadalajara doing check-in for passengers, uh, to see passengers that they were buying their tickets in LA metropolitan area, but also from further states like Oregon, Washington, or Nevada and, and, and Arizona. So Tijuana Airport has always been an airport that is used for, for not only for Mexican Americans, but for Southern California uh, uh, residents. And that's because of the connectivity that Tijuana Air Airport has. It is the number two airport in terms of direct connections from Mexico. We're going to end up the year with 36 direct uh, cities served by Tijuana, Tijuana Airport. So clearly, it makes sense to, to build this, this facility because people did not want to wait hours to cross, to cross the border. So for many years, uh, I know that there was research on what to do. Do we build a binational airport? What can we do uh, to take the whole potential of Tijuana Airport? And that was where CVX was born, to create an innovative uh, uh, solution and offering a an state-of-the-art facility f with a bridge, a 390 feet bridge to connect Tijuana Airport ticketed passengers with the Southern uh, California. And uh, currently, I'm very proud to say that 87% of our users crosses the border since they pick up their luggage there are already in San Diego within 15 minutes. So that's, that, that's fast. Uh, so let me give you some, some, some facts. Since uh, CBX was launched in 2015, December 9, 2015, we have already reached the uh, 7 million users uh, mark. And what I mentioned about the Tijuana potential, Tijuana Airport ended up in 2015 with 4.9 total users. In a 10 years, 10 years before uh, of this uh, 2015, Tijuana Airport grew 2% average in each year. Since CVX was launched, Tijuana has grown 17% uh, year over year. So in three years, 58% growth in terms of passengers and air capacity. So really, this has dynamitized that, that, that development. We're very proud that uh, just this year has been fantastic for us. Um, 
just last July, uh, we uh, have our numbers already reach 1.75 million users, and we expect to end up the year with 3 million uh, users. So we're, we're really thrilled uh, of that, and really, I think that validates the, the enormous potential of tourism and transborder tourism. And something that we feel very proud is to be participating with the uh, Visit California, San Diego Tourism Association, and everyone to create, of course, the Mexican tourism industry as well, to create this or participate in this two-nation vacation. With In the past, the Mexican leisure high-end passengers will not do the experience of waiting three hours to cross the border. Now, the tourism can come and go uh, from CVX and experience this two-nation vacation uh, experience. So over the next several years, as Senator Wesson mentioned, we will be building much more things, more surprises to come. We have 43 acres of, of land, and our expectation is to build hotels, one or two hotels, still uh, decided, conference center, restaurant area, car center and park, our additional parking lots, car service center, gas station. So we want to really contribute and be uh, uh, a detonator of the economy in, in the Southern California region. Currently, there's more than 400 jobs created and, and we look forward to create much more in the common future. So I wanted to thank you because this success could not be just uh, uh, on us. You all are part of this success. <laughs> you all cooperate and, and, and collaborate in this beautiful project, and, and, and that's a proof that we can achieve great things working together among the two nations. So I'd like to just this, uh, asking you to come and visit us. UCVX, 35 destinations in Mexico, are taking the opportunity for you to visit, but also from the California tourism industry to pursue these passengers to come and use CVX and develop the tourism industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the last 20 years, Baja California has seen uh, an enormous uh, development of a, a very exciting tourism industry. Uh, it's, it's seen a, a diversification of all of the programs and, and cultural services and cultural resources and the food industry. It's just become a wonderful place to visit in the world. And I can't think of anybody, uh, speaking very honestly, that has had more to do that with that than our next speaker, uh, Secretary of Tourism of Baja California, Oscar Escobedo, through his various roles as a businessman, uh, through uh, their, their Chamber of Commerce, Coparmex, and through Canaco, and as his current role as the Secretary of, of Tourism for the state of Baja California, we have seen just wonderful things happen in Baja California that lend to all the uh, great places people have to go and visit. The food scene in, in Tijuana is now internationally recognized. The cultural resources that are starting to appear in, in Baja are, are uh, second to none. And we are just very honored to have him here today and be part of this panel. And uh, we'd like to uh, welcome uh, Secretario Oscar Escobedo. Bienvenidos y gracias por estar aquí con nos nosotros. Estamos muy honrados. Gracias. I want to thank the senators for this opportunity and uh, to make public the necessity to do something with tourism between two nations. Eh, Don Carlos, bienvenido a San Diego, a Tijuana. Amigos todos, between what uh, Senator Hueso has said and, and Jorge here, I have nothing left. No. I just want to mention a couple of things about Baja California. Uh, last year we had 27 million people who visited the state. Out of those, 16.5, according to CBP, were people from across the border who uh, visited Baja by land. Out of those amazing, 82% are people from California. So for us, it's a big, it's a huge, 
huge market. But also we've grown, as far as the Mexican market, a couple of years ago, 80% of our tourism market was from this side of the border. Right now, even though it has increased, we have a 55% from this side of the border and 45% from the interior of Mexico. So what has happened, for example, uh, four years ago we had 3.9 people at the Tijuana airport. This year we're going to have more than 8 million people in Tijuana airport. But not only in Tijuana, Mexicali for the first time had over a million passengers by October of last year, which is a 46% increase in passengers for uh, Mexicali. So this has been, this has been great. We have also had a million passengers on the cruise lines. So that for Ensenada, which is number one in the Pacific, is also extraordinary. But what has happened with this, how did this came about? First of all, we have acknowledged we had to work on a couple of things. One of the things is that we did not have to sell destinations, we had to sell experience. It's not only about the five-star hotel, it's about your five senses. So we changed the whole strategy of how we did things, and as a result of that, we have strategic markets that have been very, very good for us. But out of those markets, there's a great opportunity to do something with California, which the truth of it, we haven't done enough. For example, it was mentioned here that uh, we can do uh, the two-nation vacation, but we can also do a two-nation convention. We can do half of the convention in Mexico, half of the convention in this side of the border. We have uh, 10,000 uh, meter, or we can have 10,000 people in this convention center, which is on ground level. That means we can do uh, exposition on machinery and have the convention on machinery on this side of the border, which has not been done before. But also, we can do something extraordinary as far as tourism, as far as the film industry tourism. Last year we had uh, 77 uh, big films filmed in Baja California. We can do a lot if we go hand in hand with uh, film tourism with California, which is something extraordinary we have not taken advantage of. Also, we have flights from China, which I think it could be extraordinary for Southern California to take advantage of this and do a two nation vacation with the Chinese market, which is a huge market as you all know. But also you have two flights for Europe, which visiting Baja California from Europe, it's complicated. We can do a two nation vacation with, with Europe. And this does not mean that people who are gonna spend six days in uh, Southern California or in California are gonna spend four and spend two in Baja. This means that this, these guys will spend 10 days in the region, which will be helpful for both of us, and that's a great opportunity that we, we also have. Also in uh, adventure, Baja California is extraordinary for tourism and adventure like California, but we can go hand in hand what has not, can't be done on this side of the border, can be done on that side of the border, or the opportunities when we join together on both sides can be something extraordinary. Also, we've been doing extraordinary good, great, as far as medical tourism, Frank Carrillo uh, won't let me lie here. He'll let me exaggerate, no, but not lie. <laughs> we have uh, last year 2.4 million people who visit uh, Baja California for medical uh, tourism. If we can do some of the services on that side of the border and some of the services on this side of the border, I know medical tourism for California is something you're looking into greatly. I think we can do something hand in hand and have more tourism, medical tourism on both sides of the border. Also, we've uh, mentioned before I show the video, I have two more comments. First, we, I mentioned the campaign, how we're, sell, we're, we're not selling destinations but experience. Let me tell you something, we won the best tourism video in the world. We had this recognition in Tortosa, Spain, which out of 500 people who competed, competed, we were number one, which is the video I'm going to show you. And we had our video for foodies, 
which we've done extraordinary as far as foodies. Out of the 27 million people who visited the state, 32% did it for the food, for the wine, or for the craft beer. Also, that campaign got us number two in Cannes. So we've been doing a good job, and I hope we can do a better job combined with uh, California. This is, was something I wasn't going to mention, Senator, but uh, you mentioned what happened with uh, CBX. Last year in Washington, we had a, a meeting with CBP, and we told them that if how the, the train crosses the border right now to deliver merchandise and it goes back and forth, we could do something with the trolley. If we have 10,000 people using that trolley, which could be a pre-clearance uh, trolley like we do in Century, you would have 20% less emissions, you have 20% less traffic, and it would be an equivalent of, you, of having 20% more personnel. The infrastructure is almost there. There would be no, not lots of money that would be needed. And for security purposes, uh, according to CBP in Washington, said it would be much easier to check people on one trolley than to check 9,000 vehicles. So that's something I leave on the table. That's something we can work with this administration or the following administration if you think we can do something with it. Mm -hmm. okay. So let me show you. I think we have the video. I bragged about all, all this time. This is an invitation for those who prefer the road less traveled, for those who want more than the ordinary, those looking for the unique, the exciting, the genuine, those looking to truly feel, to discover new sights, new perspectives, to taste all that the ocean and soil have to offer because it's not just about the five-star hotel, it's about the five-room hotel. It's about open space. It's about enjoying the journey as much as the destination. It's about the moments that make time stop and remind us what really matters. It's about connecting with each other, with nature, with life, and in that connection, realizing the importance of it all. In a place where the landscape evolves with every step taken, where the sun rises and sets in the sea, a place that stays with you. So come all wanderers, all adventurers, people tired of the same old thing, the ones looking to explore, discover, and experience something different. The ones yearning to breathe free. Because Baja isn't just a place, it's an invitation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time and your attention. <laughs> that was really nice. It's not just a place, an invitation. Baja means come down. Right on. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. That was very nice. Uh, do we have any uh, comments, questions for this panel, or any uh, comments from the committee? Members, senators? Senator Jones? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Back to uh, Carrie's uh, presentation on the visit, uh, or San Diego Tourism Authority. You mentioned that we advertise to eight countries. I'm assuming Mexico is obviously one of those. And then uh, what are the others, and, and how come we're only limiting it to eight? Uh, why not more? So thank you. Yes, so um, we are in eight countries, Mexico and Canada, also China, Australia, Japan, United Kingdom, and Germany. We've focused in on uh, markets where there is volume of travelers into San Diego and into California 
or where we have direct air access, where we need to support those airlines, those air carriers. We work closely with the San Diego International Airport. If we had more money, we'd go after more countries. <laughs> yeah. Well, after watching that, that video, I'm, I'm very hungry and I want to go surfing. <laughs> so thank you, Secretary Escobedo, uh, for that enticing invitation. Uh, I represent uh, an area a little further north of us. So um, with all due respect to San Diego and the South County, I, I, I represent uh, part of Los Angeles and Ventura County uh, in Malibu and the Santa Monica Mountains. And I just, I just want to thank uh, Senator Weso and this incredible committee. Uh, both of our countries have so much to offer. When I think of my childhood going down across the border to go surf with my buddies in Sayulita, uh, but now um, in, in my later years going to Valle, Valle de Guadalupe and looking at wine country, you think of places like Malibu and Napa and all the, the amazing opportunities California has to offer and um, the mirror is right there uh, down to the south of us. So uh, I see the future is incredibly bright for a partnership that embraces this transportation infrastructure to make it possible, uh, that sees the tax benefits of that kind of tourism growth and opens our arms to it. Those, thank you, Chairman Wayso, for uh, giving this opportunity. Thank you. And anyone else? Uh, Senator Allen? I also want to thank uh, Senator Wessel for, for pulling this together and, and all the, the great speakers. It's really been fantastic. I, I know Senator Wessel has thanked a lot of people. I want to take a moment to thank a, a group that's very special to me, and that's the audiovisual people. Perfect. And that's because uh, I was able to drive down from Los Angeles and watch uh, and not, not miss a beat on the, on the hearing. Uh, so I appreciate you. This is something that we're now doing all up and down the state. Every single hearing, no matter where it is, uh, in the state of California uh, is live streamed for folks to, to tune in um, so they can know exactly what's going on with our state Senate and including members of the committee uh, as they're on their way. So I appreciate that a great deal. Uh, I, you know, I'm excited. We're, we're actually um, you know, going to get a chance to, to experience some of the things that were uh, on the videos. But I, I want to get a better sense uh, from everybody about um, you know, how, how things work in terms of, of, of government funding for tourism promotion uh, in, both, in, in both of our respective states and, and how, how that, uh, you know, the interplay between private and public sector funds for this kind of work and, and um, you know, love the videos, love the, love the ads. I made me want to travel in both states more. Um, so I'd love to ask the panel about, about how that, the, the funding mechanisms work. Sure, so um, for uh, California cities, most of us are funded through an assessment through a tourism marketing district. That assessment is charged on visitors into hotel rooms. That goes to a board that then allocates those funds. So for San Diego, it's the City of San Diego Tourism Marketing District is what provides our funds. We receive no funding um, from the government directly. But that, dis but that district is... Is that entirely voluntary, or it's established by the government? All of those folks. It's legislated it? by the city of San Diego, okay. and it is a self-assessment, and it is uh, has criteria in terms of it being a benefit district, with the hotels voting to assess themselves and their guests. Now, if you, um, so. Now, if a hotel is within the district but did not vote to make the assessment, they still have to pay. If, it, if you meet the criteria of the assessment district, and every district is a little bit different, for the city of San Diego, it's hotels with 70 rooms or more uh -huh. that are assessed. And if you have a majority of those assessed rooms and properties who vote yes to do that, then yes, it is an assessment. And it's specifically focused on hotels? Correct, only hotels. Okay. Gotcha. And in San Diego, we also, there's that mechanism in the city of San Diego and in all cities, including the city of San Diego, an additional a round of funding comes from the TOT funding that comes from the, it's called the, 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 the transient, transient occupancy, occupancy tax. tax. And, so cities collect transient occupancy taxes and then city councils um, and mayors will choose to where those dollars should flow. And, and, and they typically a percentage of those, I know at least in the city of San Diego and most cities in this county, go toward promoting the city and tourism. and. and events that attract tourism so okay. they can fund 
a, uh, they can fund a, a, a mobile market, they can fund uh, concerts, they can fund uh, uh, different uh, local uh, fairs and uh, events. And so all of your funding comes from that assessment district? Correct. Not, okay. So it is through that private mechanism that our funding comes through. It's like an interesting public-private thing, I guess, to, to the extent that it's authorized by legislation. It is, um, yes. You know, the other, so the, in that Visit California ad that we saw, that, that, does that come out of, who funds Visit California? So Visit California is also an assessment district. For the um, state? So for the state of California, and it is a variety of businesses that are in that assessment district. So it is based on whether your business is uh, benefiting from tourism. And if so, then it's a, an assessment paid into that fund, which is then overseen by a commission board, and much that was like a, a commodities board. Statewide vote of, of travel related businesses Correct. up and down the and state. And it's also through the legislature. Huh. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And how about in Baja California? What, what, do we, what do we do there? What's the nature of public and private funds? Basically, it's a 3% TOT tax, which. Uh, the hotels. Which. Uh, out of that, we give 29% to the cities, and the state does the umbrella campaign, and each city does their own, their own campaign. Cool. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you, guys. You said the TOT is only 3%. Well, 3% goes to this. 3% for the assessed. 3% total. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, I had a question as it relates to medical tourism, and is it a particular speci specialty that Californians go down to visit a physician for, or is it just overall general health care, and is our in insurance policies pretty much uh, received? Oh, but I just, he's an expert on tourism, so I'm just curious as well. Uh, basically, it's a uh Depends on the city, like Algodón is a lot of uh, dentistry. Uh, Frank Carrillo, for example, has an HMO for people from California on that side of the border, and just uh, people who do pre, and we have a, a lot of plastic uh, surgery also. But thank you very much. Thank you, it's worked well. Yep. <laughs> we need to get you down here. <laughs> Senator Wesser, if I, if I may, I, I sure. wanted to also uh, promotion is, is very important for developed tourism, but also the whole process. And I want to point out on something that would really help to develop more tourism, cross-border tourism. Uh, and that's the, the federal I-94 uh, tax. When you, cr when you arrive by, by air, you already have that tax pay on your air ticket. When you cross by land, even the regular borders or CBX, you have to go to a secondary process on immigration. And that's because if you're driving more than 25 miles uh, inland, you need to pay that tax. That's, that is a bit harder for, for, for the customers, an additional process. And there is no commonality about the borders. For instance, Texas, if you are 100 miles uh, in, inland, you don't pay that, that tax. So I think there will be a huge opportunity to keep development in the tourism, the transborder tourism, if we can extend that line of where does that travelers need to pay that, that tax. So I can brief you more about that, but there is a huge opportunity. We will welcome more passengers, make the process more efficient, and just go to a primary process with immigration. And that is uh, a tax law on this side of the border? It is uh, on the U.S. tax, yeah, that's Feder correct. Federal? Federal tax. On, on our side of the border that's here right. in California. That's right, okay. but it's not the same in each state. Texas, as I mentioned, is already 100 miles where you can drive freely without paying the tax. Here in California, it's only 25 miles. So if you go, for instance, northern of San Diego, you need to go and do the secondary process with CBP. And maybe that's something we can work with with our local congressman, Juan Vargas. I think that He's been a, a really good advocate for helping to reduce border wait times. He's actually been pretty, pretty right. darn huge in helping us with all of that. So. that would he really could be somebody that's front. instrumental. We have two mm -hmm. people, Antonio and Eddie Meyer here. Right. Antonio Martinez from his office. So, yeah. notes, gentlemen, notes. <laughs> thank you. We, we should look at that. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to continue with our panelists.
We have uh, with us a uh, uh, very distinguished professor, Armando Vasquez Ramos. He's the coordinator of the California-Mexico project, and he's back again. He's testified at other committee's hearings that he's had. His testimony is always very insightful, so we, we welcome him, him back often. We also have uh, Veronique Rorev, the assistant director of the UC Mexico Initiative. Did I pronounce that correctly? Great, thank you. And and um, and the next panel after this one would be on the healthcare uh, part of tourism. And uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so thank much, you. Senator uh, Wesso, and um, uh, certainly it's a great honor for me to uh, to participate. Thank you for the invitation. And and what I would like to do is to bring into context <laughs> the role of education in this uh, binational identity that we're searching for. And, and something that may not be as exciting or as uh, uh, advanced as it is in this case, the, the uh, huge impact that tourism is having along the border. So it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I wanted to um, also uh, remind you that we're also connected by the educational systems uh, across the border and between California and Mexico uh, throughout. But there is very little, very, very little exchange of faculty and students. So let me give you just a background uh, and, and the experience that I have. Um, because, uh, and again, let me just reintroduce myself. Uh, I am Professor Armando Vasquez Ramos uh, from uh, Cal State Long Beach. And since 1981, I have been involved with California Mexico Educational Exchange. And I have taken, on many occasions, students and faculty to study in Mexico since 1996. I also worked in the CSU Chancellor's Office, in the Office of International Programs, uh, for almost three years back in the mid-90s. Uh, and in, six, in 1969, I was um, a co-founder of the Cal State Long Beach Chicano and Latino Studies Department. I know that dates me, right? That's exactly 50 years ago. Um, but I was one of the uh, Mecha student leaders. So we were the students that opened the doors to higher education in California, public colleges and universities. And in that role, I'm, I'm, I'm a very proud activist that have been now for uh, more than 30 years following or uh, promoting yeah. this educational exchange between California and Mexico. Um, I have also... Uh, been following, and I, I believe that today's hearing uh, it ideally coincides with Governor Gavin Newsom's initiatives to restore bilateral cooperation between California and Mexico. Um, and this has to do also, in particular, with higher education. I'm looking forward to the presentation by my colleague on what the UC system has and of course the governor is pursuing reopening the office in Mexico City that was shut down back in the early 2000 uh, this, uh, under the uh, tenure of Governor uh, Gray Davis. Um, but this initiative by Governor Newsom is to promote not only higher education but also trade and commerce innovation and research, and creates a great opportunity for California to lead the way as policies and programs of this effort are shaped over the next few years. This is something that we had. Mexico City was our largest office in the world. And of course, given the downturn at that point, it was, uh, it was, uh, the government was forced to close it. But in my opinion, what is most important today is the opportunity that lies ahead. And the leadership that this committee can provide to develop a comprehensive and long-term set of higher education policies that reflects the importance of the California-Mexico relationship in the 21st century for a region that is already one of the most productive in the world. However, in the case of, of the, the um, the Cal State system, unlike the UC Mexico initiative, and this is where our colleague will uh, give a background in terms of what the UC system 
uh, has with Mexico. The, U, the CSU, the California State University System, lacks a similar initiative. And after the three-year ban on travel to Mexico by former Chancellor, CSU Chancellor Charlie Reed, the system has barely returned to about 30% of the former enrollment in the CSU Mexico Study Abroad Program. Um, I have shared this presentation with the members of the, of the committee, the senators that are with us, and you may see that chart. Uh, it is very, very low. And the idea of commenting on this is to promote why we need to expand, why we need to improve, in particular within the CSU system, but also across California's higher educational all three systems. The community college, 113 uh, community colleges throughout the state, they have study abroad. And in this case, the CSU system has barely returned to about 30% of the former uh, enrollment back in the 1990s, where I worked at the chancellor's office, and which at that time was about 65 to 70 students system-wide. Out of 23 campuses, we're talking about approximately three students per campus. Well, let me tell you, uh, and this is some research that I did, this is updated information I just got within the last uh, uh, few days. We have now, in the last five years, enrolled only 18, 16, 13, 25, and this year, 11 in the CSU Mexico Study Web Program, which is housed at the uh, the, um, the Tec de Monterrey campus in Querétaro. Uh, it used to be in Mexico City at Iberoamericana, but it is very cons disconcerting that we don't have a much greater amount of students from California's uh, Cal State system. Uh, and let me go on to uh, reflect why this is of great concern. The CSU has grown to more than 450 students to become the largest university system in the United States, with more than 150,000 Mexican, Chicano, Latino enrollment, one third, and growing close to become the majority within this decade in the CSU system, and topping more than 30% currently. Given the growing interdependence between California as the fifth largest economy of the world and Mexico as the 13th largest economy of the world, this also represents that Latinos are a significant human resource that could be critically important to the economic future of the California and Mexico region. And that all connects with what has been presented. Uh, this is to, to underscore why we need to do more. And undoubtedly, there has been a significant decrease in, in the California-Mexico educational exchange due to the CSU's ban, but also due to the downturn of the economy at that point when the, the, the ban went into effect, and the fear that we have about security, about crime, about the narco war that we have in Mexico. But I would point to one additional uh, problem that we have in the CSU system. We don't have the institutional culture to promote study abroad for our students in Mexico. And I'll tell you why. There's three centers, three cities in Spain where even Latinos, even Mexicanos, rather to go to study Spanish. And somebody was telling me earlier this morning that well, oh, Phil was telling me that, uh, that one of his friends went to, to learn Spanish in, in, uh, in, in Spain, and they come back speaking a little rare, huh? It's not the cultural context, it's not the kind of Spanish that we are more likely to use in the classroom as teachers or in any professional field. So notwithstanding uh, this reality, uh, back in 2008, Assembly members Jose Solorio and, and Kevin Delon, who have now both are out, out of the legislature, sponsor a, an, a, a um, joint resolution, an assembly concurrent resolution number 146, 
They recognized the California-Mexico project that I established at Cal State Long Beach, but also they directed for the California Research Bureau to conduct a study, a report on California-Mexico study bar programs. So it's been almost uh, more than 10 years, and I would call upon the committee for the senators that are here to revisit that and to, to bring up to date for the California Research Bureau to update those figures. How are we doing? And not only Cal State, but the UC and the community colleges, because there's great lessons to be learned from that, that uh, research that was done. And I just want to uh, uh, conclude, because I know that I don't want to take more than the five minutes allocated. Uh, the, uh, the report is, uh, points to a lot of the obvious uh, development resources need to be applied. But I would like to make the following recommendations for the committee to consider. Um, the way that the, the, that the governor is leaning at this point is a fantastic opportunity for the committee to expand um, collaboration with Calif between California and Mexico's colleges and universities. It is also a great opportunity to convene a conference that could develop joint uh, planning and ventures that could expand this academic exchange. And then also the fact that what we need is to develop greater collaboration between the institutions to exchange faculty and students. And for that, I also propose in this paper the concept of a one-to-one -one exchange between colleges and universities, because that's how you can eliminate the out-of-state tuition. If you exchange a student uh, from a Mexican university with a California institution, neither one has to pay for out-of-state tuition. But again, these are long-term ideas and recommendations that are in the paper. And again, I thank you for giving me this opportunity today and to uh, share some of these concepts and ideas uh, for the audience. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you so much, Professor Armando Vasquez, for really setting up the challenges and the issues that we are facing throughout the state of California in our public institutions. As he so eloquently said, we share the same challenges, be it within the UC, the Cal State, and the community colleges. And I think it's very important to recognize that if it wasn't because of our faculty, and you'll hear this in a moment when I give my presentation, our faculty are really the drivers for our, our faculty exchanges. And before I get into my talk, one thing I wanted to share with our, our colleagues from Visit California and whatnot is, through our institutions, you have an access, a venue of being able to build up additional travel opportunities. So for example, HACU, which is the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, in October 2022, they're going to be here in San Diego. So it's an opportunity to visit this binational visit and to see how we can engage with Tijuana and Senada and our other education systems here in, along the border. And, but just to throw that out. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. To give you a little bit more perspective, up until 2015, any kind of activity that was taking place in terms of academic mobility, this is student, faculty, staff, going back and forth between California and Mexico, it was primarily being driven at, within the UC by our faculty, by our campuses. In 2015, there was a agreement signed between President Obama and President um, Peña Nieto. That, it's called FOBESI. It is basically a binational agreement for education, innovation, technology. That agreement created a system, I mean, a bilateral, binational perspective of engagement that to this day is the founding principle of the, the UC Mexico initiative. 
What is important about this is we are, for example, within the UC system, we started to track our academic mobility to Mexico as a system. That's our 10 campuses, our national labs, as well as our medical schools. We rose, we gained 37% increase in mobility because we focused on this FOBESI as our platform. I'm bringing this up because it is an example, and California is not the only one. I'm sure that um, Consul General Gonzalez can give you examples too of Texas and whatnot. It has created, it opened wide the doors and the opportunities. It is through FOBESI that I, I have been able to, to work with our colleagues in the Cal State as well in the community colleges. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that that type of engagement where that kind of support is brought out, California can be a leader. We already had this with President Obama. I think this is an opportunity for California to explore. As I mentioned, um, we do have cultural and educational tourism. This is the breadth of a global engagement. This is our, what we promote and what we push. This is the future that we want for our students. It's important to recognize that this kind of binational travel, be it here at the border, as well as further inland, mainland from both regions. It is a founding principle for the type of future talent workers and individuals and contributors that we want in our society. We have students who are going back and forth, as you obviously know, to pursue their graduate degrees. We currently will be hosting in February, I mean welcoming this, sub this September more than 160 graduate students who will be coming into the UCs, all the 10 UC campuses. We are currently here in San Diego, at UC San Diego, hosting more than 110 undergraduates from Mexico who are participating in a summer research internship program. We also are hosting in September 120 university students from the University of Chapingo who are solely coming to get familiar with California's agricultural systems. They will be primarily visiting Riverside and UC Davis, but all along the way they will be stopping to do visits throughout um, getting to become more familiar with the way our agriculture systems are integrated with the university and how there is that connection between the private and the public sector. In addition to that, it's these type of agreements, these type of mobility opportunities that allow us to really be able to build a program. So before 2014, the University of California, all of our campuses had a program, had some kind of an engagement with Mexico. But it wasn't until 2014 that we started to look, what can we do as a system? So instead of doing it campus by campus, how could we look and bring together, integrate opportunities across the, the system and be able to work with our colleagues in Mexico to really address the challenges and opportunities that we have on both sides of the border. And so as, as such, we've been able to do collaborations with the, Secretary, the Ministry of Energy. In 2016, we were able to do a six plus million dollar um, grant system with them where we were able to encourage integration between our Mexico universities and UC campuses to be able to address clean energy, um, energy efficient opportunities. We currently have, um, some of you, I don't know, I know that those from, from up north, you're familiar with UC Davis. We have a top of the line energy light efficiency center. Well, we are now building with our colleagues in Mexico, the University of Guadalajara, as our, the director there says, a better system that is now integrated. So this is a UC Davis University of Guadalajara Research Energy Efficiency Light Center that will be top of the line, that will be beneficial to, to both regions. As I mentioned, we do, it's our faculty engagement that, that really has been the most successful. 
We do have the traditional education abroad program. For the UC, it's primarily UNAM instead of the Tech de Monterrey. And one of the things we want to do is we want to spin it. We want to stop just looking at this one-on-one -on -one reciprocal, and we want to rethink what are the best ways of being able to do exchanges, be it very short term, be it just for a couple of weeks, to potentially six years for when a student is, is pursuing their graduate degree. Um, in addition to that, you may be familiar to of our UC Mexis. This is the UC Institute for Mexico in the United States. It has a more than 30 year history of working with Mexico, especially CONACYT, which is the equivalent of our National Science Foundation. They have sponsored more than 596 graduate students. These are Mexico University students who have come up, completed their master's or PhD, 596. We have more than 800 faculty research collaborations that have been sponsored. These are the baselines as to what continues the dialogue at an educational level and a cultural exchange level between higher education institutions. And thank you very it. much. <laughs> we, we, as uh, Mr. Goycortua Goy here, still, oh, there you are. We have a question regarding flights and what flights are chosen at airports, and our, our mayor wants to know about the Filipino community. There, uh, we have one of the largest Filipino communities in California here, locally and here especially, in, and, there, and the question is flights to Manila or the Philippines. Why isn't that uh, something that has, has the Tijuana Airport looked at that as a potential route? And uh, is that something that's possible? So in, in uh, mid-September, there's a big conference where airlines and airports meet. It's called Routes in Australia. I'm going to be part of that. The whole focus of Grupo Aeroportuario del Pacifico will be on the CBX and this transborder crossing. We're meeting with uh, Philippine Airlines among around 13 other carriers to try to attract more. We'll compete with San Diego on, on that, but I think uh, their goal is anyway bring more more air service into into the region. So I uh, hope I can I can bring it. This is a long process and something remarkable that I want to mention. Tijuana Airport will invest close to 100 million dollars in the next few years uh, to develop a new facility which will allow international inbound passengers to cross directly through the United States without entering into Mexico and vice versa. That will really convert a truly binational facility, uh, CVX and Tijuana Airport. You know, since Jorge is here, yep. I, with your, with yes, your indulgence, yes. Mr. Chair, I, you know, maybe this is a question better, better had um, you know, in private, but I, I was wondering, what, are there kind of tensions but also synergies with San Diego Airport? I mean, do they, you know, was this development looked upon as a, as a negative, as a positive with regards to San Diego Airport tensions? Let no, me. I wouldn't say that. Uh, the opposite. We're working together. Uh, we're about to present a project where we can facilitate the, the transfer of passengers because we understand Tijuana won't, won't have flights into the U.S. and it will be very difficult that uh, San Diego will get uh, flies into Mexico just because the taxation uh, process and, and it's completely different flying domestic versus international. So we're working together to develop an, uh, plans to, to elaborate. And then we're also taking advantage of the curfew that San Diego Airport has, the limitations on the runway. So I think we believe we can complement each other mm -hmm. and we're working close with, with them. I think at the beginning, as it was very similar to Tijuana's people, when we launched CVX, they expect that we will steal passengers getting into Tijuana and that has not been the case. Is we're working and collaborate together with San Diego to complement each other's network. Mm -hmm. and, and you know we've been working for well over 20 years to site a new airport in San Diego, but we, we're in competition with uh, some military airfields that are of strategic importance to the country, and they take up a lot of uh, real estate in our county. Uh, that includes Camp Pendleton, 
uh, North Island uh, and Miramar. Right. So this and is taking so some of the what, regional you know, So when you, we look at the air travel, we've looked at, um, we have Brownfield, which is an international airport here in Otay Mesa, but it has limitations based on the mountain range. Mm -hmm. So the geography in San Diego makes it very hard to site an airport, which, I mean, uh, right now San Diego is the busiest one runway airport in the nation. And so wow. the, having a relationship with Tijuana works out very well for us because it gives more options to travelers to travel from an international airport with uh, destinations that connect with the rest of the world uh, in areas that San Diego does not provide. So mm. uh, this what San Diego has in, in options depends on what Tijuana has. So it's, it's been an actual uh, a relationship that's worked very well for our region and something that we're looking to expand on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and that was a good answer. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to bring our next uh, panel. Thank you very much for being here and for your comments. Uh, our next panel has to do with health care. And uh, health care is also a big industry, not only in California and Mexico, and we have a lot of unique relationships with the health care resources that are pr available on both sides of the border. And we wanted to talk about how uh, that is important to our no, all, not only our economy, but to the well-being of, of the people of our state and how people also preserve visiting this region because of the health care resources that we can provide. So we have Frank Carrillo. He is the CEO of, of Sistemas Médicos Nacionales, also known locally as SIMSA. Uh, he is a provider of health care services to <coughs> his, his customer base is largely people living in the United States that are of Mexican origin that go to uh, provide, uh, get uh, HMO, HMO services in Mexico. And we have Erin Ureña, the Director of Medical Tourism for the state of Baja California. And Carla Nagel, the Health Tourism CEO for the new Medical City Plaza. Welcome, and we'll begin with uh, Mr. Carrillo. Welcome. Thank you. Thank for being you. Here. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Senator Pengueso and uh, members of the committee for holding this event. Very important. Um, I know we're running late, um, getting hungry. I'm losing, we're losing audience already here. Yeah. So before we, I stand here by myself, I think we better, better hurry. Um, I'm gonna talk about SIMSA. SIMSA uh, is a company that was born in, in, in Tijuana in, in the late 90s. Uh, SIMSA became licensed by the state of California, the first, first Mexican company uh, in healthcare, that was uh, admitted uh, to California as a licensed HMO, and uh, we start. I'm the founder. Uh, we started at, at zero, and now we have about 70,000 participants. Um, there is another health plan uh, similar to ours, a little small. They 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 just became licensed about six seven years ago. So in all, we provide service to about 80,000, 90,000 uh, subscribers, all of whom are residents of uh, San Diego County and Imperial County. Those are the two counties that we, we serve. Um, SIMSA is the largest, of course. We, we've been in business so over 20 years already. Um, very successfully, we've been growing and growing. Uh, we are the exclusive providers of Anthem, Aetna, and HealthNet, which also provide transborder health. Um, they have uh, specific plans that, that provide services in Mexico. And um, transborder health is, um, is a win-win for both sides of the border. Of course, for Mexico, it's a, um, a great generator of, of income, uh, $1.2 billion in revenue uh, yearly. But it's a win also for the side of the border in that people can find affordable health care, that otherwise probably wouldn't, wouldn't have, wouldn't get. Uh, friendly, and I think it's high quality as well. Uh, as far as the HMO, we have contracts with about 600 employer groups on both, in both San Diego and Imperial counties, about 70% here in the San Diego area. Uh, companies like General Dynamics, um, Marriott, Hilton, almost every major hotel is a member of SIMSA. 
uh, all the casinos in San Diego as well, in labor unions, school districts, in every, we have many, many various uh, uh, type of industries. Uh, how, do, how do they win? They save money on premiums. Uh, our, our premiums are about one half of what they are on this side of the border and for the same service. And um, so we are filling a vacuum. Those, those savings, of course, go towards um, providing care for other employees. So it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. This thing is a win-win for everyone. Um, the infrastructure, medical infrastructure of Tijuana, of Baja California, is, con is always growing and growing. And an example of that is a video that we have that will show uh, our latest venture, which is a hospital. We were building a hospital that will be completed in 2021 with an investment of about $140 million. And our investment is only one part of the whole investment. Uh, the, the new city, uh, the person that is here uh, representing him. Uh, but altogether, I think we're investing about $400 million in infrastructure in the uh, city of Tijuana. So let's play the video. This will be a 120-bed hospital uh, that is being built right around the medical center that we have. We, SIMS is, a, is like a Kaiser model. We, we, we are the insurance as well as the, the providers of care. We have about 400 physicians in our, in our network um, and about 600 employees. This is in Tijuana. This is right across the border about um, a, a, an iron, uh, uh, two iron shot from, uh, from the border. Or less. Who hits a two iron anymore? In terms, in terms of uh, golf. <laughs> like, who hits a two iron anymore? <laughs> it, it is 300 yards. Um, we have uh, parking, uh, parking spaces there for 1,200 vehicles already built. And this is how the hospital is beginning to look. We, you can already see, go and see that it's beginning to shape up already. Um, the, um, and, and right in the center of this building that you're seeing, we have a medical center. So this not only will be a hospital, it will be also an outpatient medical center, the largest dental office, Senator Bradford, I think you, 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 were, you were inquiring about dentistry. We have about 50 dentists working in that uh, dental, dental office, dental center. Um, we provide not only uh, medically necessary services, but also cosmetic. We have a spa. We have regenerative medicine, including uh, stem cell therapy. So we're way, way ahead of everybody, everyone else here. Very beautiful facility. Um, um, they will be providing uh, everything uh, that is medically needed, including cardiology, transplants, um, Hopefully, it'll be also an investigative uh, uh, hospital. We're gonna have investigations as well. Uh, a lot of open air spaces. Uh, we feel that it's very important for healing, uh, that they feel that if they're not in the hospital, they're in a resort. And this is what it looks like. It will look like a resort with a, with a shopping center inside. They will have uh, beauty shops, um, pharmacies, uh, uh, many, many other things uh, included. We have six, seven terraces, uh, uh, beautiful restaurant, 24-hour emergency care. So this facility can easily compete with any, any other hospital in, the, uh, in this region. Uh, we're building it so that, so that it'll, it'll, it'll have the, uh, be competitive with any, any facility in, in the world. Thank you. So to, uh, I think it'll play for another two or three minutes, but I think I'll, I'll close it now so that I can answer any questions and okay. we can go and eat. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to, uh, to uh, Aaron Aron Ureña. Good afternoon. Thank you. Th thank you for having here um, in this very important reunion. It is a pleasure to be here and meet everyone. 
I wonder to start with a short video. Man, you won't believe what happened to me this weekend. I messed up my tooth, went to the dentist. Now, the insurance won't cover it. I got a copay. I don't know what I'm gonna do, man. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I also went to the dentist, and it was pretty cool. Yes. That's a great ad. Health and wellness. This is Baja California. Um, in this presentation, I, I wanted to, to show you the growth of the medical tourism in our state and how the public policy has collaborated to achieve the safety and the trust of our, our region. So the next, uh, sorry. As you can see on the map, we show you the uh, zones by state uh, where mainly medical uh, visitors we receive is high uh, percentages coming from uh, California, 49%, and 27% uh, uh, is from uh, Arizona. Okay, uh, the monthly average of uh, adult uh, visitor in, in, in the medical tourism in, in Baja California is uh, about 2,000 uh, and, and 2,500 uh, dollars. And the other statistic, uh, the mostly 40% of the visitors is, is uh, Hispanic and about 10% uh, is uh, Caucasic and, and, and the 10% of uh, Canadian uh, as well. On 2016, 2.4 million of patients and companion uh, visit Baja California. Thanks for that. Uh, of state is the income is a 800 uh, million of dollar for this uh, for medical tourism. On 2018, we have an income of 1,000 million of dollar. Also, I'm very grateful to mention that on this year we we were our second place in medical tourism globally. I'm very proud to, to mention Baja California is the first uh, the pioneer state in Mexico with a public policy for health tourism development, which number one priority is to provide safety and protection for the patient and the companion. Uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, we would like to encourage to start a binational platform to allow our doctors from Mexico and the U.S. have access for the patient medical records under the most strictly international protocols in order to provide the proper medical care and follow up in both sides of the border. This is for warranty, the patient trust, and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello, thanks for the invitation. I am very proud and honored to represent uh, New City Medical Plaza in the name of Abadi family, and especially in this effort of joining private enterprise and public efforts to do this a reality. So if, can you put the presentation please? I'm gonna take just two minutes. Um, I have been in this industry around three years, really understanding how to create a service that is not bilingual, but bicultural. Uh, we really do understand things in a different way, even if we speak the same language. So uh, one thing that uh, we did very profoundly, it's a study in the States to understand well, which ones were the pillars to create this business. And one of the most important ones is really integrating the service among tourism and medical. When you were talking about tourism, we know it's adventure. I don't have, don't worry, don't worry. So when you talk about tourism, it's adventure. When you took, talk, uh, talk about medical, uh, people feel vulnerable. So it looks like very opposite words, words to put together. Huh? So the pillars that we find out that were very important is that the patients in the States really want to have an integrated service, somebody that fully advocates for them and responds for them. Right now, uh, some companies, as seems are, are doing amazingly because they integrate services, but it's not the reality of how this is happening in Mexico. So one thing that we need to create is really the quality that you expect as an um, American patient, but with the b best of both worlds that we are here in the border to, to have insurance in a different cost, as SIMS is doing, and the quality of service. So I think that this is a, an amazing opportunity. The building of, of Medical Plaza, it's 25,000 meters of different medical specialties with hotel that it's already open, it with commercial centers for uh, 500, 500 meters from the border. So we are really looking at, to another facility of the qu quality of SIMSA and really trying to do things with the government in a different and very professional way to have a different approach to this industry because it's new, it's not mature, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities for all of us to work in this together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I want to apologize. We, want to, we went over significantly over on time, but uh, we got through it. Thank you to everyone that participated, and thank you for being here today. And uh, I just wanted to, if anybody didn't if anybody has any questions we can offer them now and if anybody in the public would like to make a comment also uh, if anybody wants to come forward and make a comment sir just come up to the mic and just share give us maybe a minute comment if you could yes sir well first of all thank you for putting this together um, as a native of Tijuana I mean we've seen our fair share of bad publicity we still see it uh, but on the other side uh, of things, I mean, you hear about... Now let the, us know your name. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Dr. Ariel Ortiz. I'm also a surgeon, a colleague of, the, uh, of all of uh, okay. my friends here. I have a weight loss surgery center. I've been in this business for 20 years, mostly doing a couple of thousand surgeries per year on U.S. and Canadian patients traveling to Mexico. So uh, one of the most important things that we've seen is that even though we're still offering uh, high quality service in certain areas, uh, one of the things that we've also seen, like I was saying, is that, that uh, less than ideal publicity once in a while when things don't go as well. And uh, specifically talking about that, uh, I want to refer to Dr. Aron Ureña because I know we've been working a little bit together on creating this culture of accreditation in Mexico. The only way you can guarantee a high quality healthcare service is not by patting yourself on the back in your uh, online advertising, but by actually getting a third party accreditation which is uh, uh, respected around the world, such like Joint Commission International. 
And because it's a traveling patient, now you have to uh, address certain additional issues because the patient is actually traveling and you want to keep them safe, you want to keep their family members safe. So I know there's been uh, a new accreditation that just came on, on board, which is the uh, Global Healthcare Accreditation that you've been working on, Dr. Ureña. So maybe he, uh, he could uh, comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you. We'll, we'll wrap up now. Uh, ma madam? Yes, please. While she's up, yes, go ahead. While, while she's coming up, I just want to make a quick comment and uh, recognize uh, Professor Vasquez Ramos. Uh, your chart that you shared with this, uh, I'm an, an alumnus of San Diego State uh, University, and my daughter is currently attending there. My son's graduated from there. And I'm noticing that they have zero uh, students uh, exchanging with Mexico. and. Um, I'm going to talk, my daughter's in the International Business Department, specializing in Spanish, and uh, she chose to go to Spain, but the, for us it was a personal decision because we have friends uh, there, but I'm going to ask her uh, when, when I get home about uh, if Mexico was promoted at all uh, within her department, and um, I'll give that information back to Senator Oeso so that we can keep an eye on what's going on there. So thank you for your presentation, I appreciate it. Thank you. Madam. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Vallardo Miquez. Um, I'm 63 years old and I've lived in San Diego County my whole life. Uh, the last 37 years in um, the South Bay. And I thank you for this presentation. It was very uh, informational and I really appreciate everything that has been being done in terms of tourism. Um, but one of my concerns, whether it's tourism or is actually um, a resident of California. It was interesting, I think, that um, Ms. Newton mentioned that um, in one of the surveys it was mentioned about California, the image of California being a factor rated in terms of whether tourists come here. And um, from the time I was little, I've traveled across the border in terms of visiting family in El Sausal, Ensenada. And one of the things that especially I'd like to direct to our elected officials um, is the issue of security. Um, not only uh, in Mexico in terms of the border, uh, I have family members that live in different parts of Mexico. And that is a real concern, the safety. Uh, the crime and California in terms of my husband and I travel cross country this summer and honestly uh, one of the images of California is we are not a law and order state and I think we need to put action in terms of having our state be a state that protects the people that either come here as visitors or that live here. Since okay. we've been in here 37 years in the South Bay, we've had three vehicles stolen. You, and let me just finish, please. Yeah, but I, I, it's a one minute, and I've already given you two okay. minutes. So if you could just thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your comments, and thank you for being here today. And I will just want to uh, finish up by uh, you know uh, thanking everybody and. Uh, I'm working on two bills that will, one will create a California-Mexico Commission and the idea is to uh, get a Citizens Commission involved in, in resolving some of the opportunities uh, uh, that uh, we share in, in realizing and also coming up with uh, legislative solutions to some of these uh, that the legislature can act on. Also uh, that's uh, SB 558 and I'm also proposing establishing a California office in Mexico. It's not specific to any region, but the idea would be to establish an office to assist travelers, people in education, people in business, doing business with Mexico, and how to navigate through the Mexican uh, uh, system. And uh, those, uh, those issues, we hope, will, will uh, bring us closer to Mexico. And, and uh, I think I just want to encourage people to community, continue to call my office, continue to call us, communicate with us about how we can do to better serve you and how we, what we can act to further uh, this dialogue that we've started here today and that it's been a, an ongoing dialogue uh, you know, since uh, we, we started this committee. So 
uh, a lot has happened and uh, we have a lot to celebrate but there's always more work to be done and I look forward to continuing down that path. Thank you very much and everybody have a nice day.